Morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another um, Adland conversation in partnership with um, AdFocus. Um, today, I've got Pepe, Veli, and Kenzi. Um, they will introduce themselves. But um, a conversation that we want to have today um, stems from obviously um, the narrative that's out there around transformation, but also um, Black Lives Matter globally. And we thought we have a conversation with some um, industry leaders in terms of how we can um, Im improve on diversity and inclusion in our industry, but obviously give tools um, and learnings um, to some of you out there who are asking themselves, how is it that my business can um, transform? So um, without further ado, uh, I'll let the lady uh, introduce herself first. Uh, what she does, um, where her headspace is at in terms of the topic, and then we we'll go to Veli, and then we we'll finish off with Pepe. Uh, morning, Kenzi. Hey, Bongani. Hi, Veli. Hi, Pepe, and hi to everyone who's listening. So, as Bongani said, my name is Kenzi. I head up marketing and corporate affairs at NetBank. I think the marketing part is pretty obvious, but the corporate affairs part means I look after CSI and transformation, by the way. Um, so in the context of where my mind space is at about transformation, I'll maybe talk about it in two parts. One, in the context of the bank that I work for, I think, you know, as NetBank, we absolutely believe that we cannot be a sustainable bank in an unsustainable country. So for us to be successful, we need South Africa to be successful. And for us, diversity and transformation is actually a successful, is, is a successful country. So we are a firm believer in driving transformation, driving diversity, and not just, you know, on the FSTC charter, which is the financial services charter from a BE perspective, but beyond those codes. That is something we absolutely believe in. Um, what is fantastic about that is it, it absolutely aligns to my personal vision and my personal purpose. And it's very rare that you get to work for an organization that believes in what you believe in. So I became group executive at NetBank in... I think it was bloody hell. I think it was May 2018 or something. And one of the big things that I wanted to focus on definitely was around driving transformation. I want to work with agencies that are transformed and believe in transformation in the context of South Africa. I want to do work that drives the right conversations when it comes to our brand and our banking products. I want to build a marketing team that you know reflects South Africa. So, you know, for me, Bongani, this isn't even, you know, like a, a by the way conversation, which is core to who sure. I am. Unfortunately, I happen to work for a brand and a bank that absolutely believes in it. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks for joining us and giving us the time. Veli, morning, Chief. Love to meet yourself. Um, hi, hi, Bongani. Thank you. Uh, hi, Pepe. Hi, Kenzie. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the platform. I, I do think it's a very important conversation. And, and I do think um, the change in the conversation is something that I've been encouraged about. I think for a long time, we've been talking about transformation and the conversations uh, that I've been having um, are more about the action of transformation and, and what we need to do uh, to go beyond just the talking about it. Now, uh, my name is Veli Ngubane. Uh, I'm the founding partner uh, and chief uh, creative officer uh, of the largest fully black-owned uh, agency, Avatar, uh, which is now eight years old. Um, so really, my view on transformation is, 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 is from an entrepreneurial lens. Um, to say, uh, how can we transform the industry using entrepreneurship? And, and more so, I think there's been a lot of talk around what, you know, what is the, when, when do we reach transformation? And, and I was telling someone yesterday, you know, saying that when you walk into an industry room or industry awards and you look around, so if I had to take you, and put you, plonk you into an industry awards or an industry function, right? And I blindfolded you and I, you, just, you, just, you just woke up there and you looked around and you had to tell me what year that is, right? Is it 2020? Is it 1994? Is it 1983? You'll find that no one will tell you this is a reflection of the society as it currently stands. Now, 
unfortunately, um, the way black economic empowerment laws and transformation in general has been positioned and is something that I would love people to start moving away from because it's been politicized because of our political history, right? Oh. Now, transformation is, is, is really about correcting the wrongs of the past, but it's not about taking away someone's livelihood and rights because I think the way it's previously been positioned is uh, black people replacing white people, which is not the case. Uh, yeah. what, what is happening and what should happen is an equitable share of the industry so that we can grow the industry. So the benefits of, 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 of um, transformation, I don't think are well communicated to most people. So that is really my overall thinking. And I'm sure we're gonna get into it uh, uh, deeper because we need to um, also go beyond the, the laws and the MAC charter and do the greater good of making sure that the country is, 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 is transformed through our yeah. industry. So a lot of people stop by the laws and they, they stop by the BE certificate because it's almost mm. like a business imperative, but this goes beyond. So, so, so thank you for the opportunity. I'm, 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 I'm happy to be on this platform. Thank you. Thanks, man. Morning, Pepe. So, so for, the, for the longest time, I thought Accenture was going to be the guys that will announce the Joe public deal. And, uh, and we kept watching and then, um, Breaking news, you guys are 60% black owned. Um, so congratulations on that deal. But yeah, morning and welcome. As they say, you're mute. <laughs> <laughs> I did that on purpose. So um, the rookie mistake after 120 days of using this tool. But by means of introduction, my name's Pepe Marie and I am the head of creative together with Kulisa Jesana at Joe Public United, and I'm also the co-founder of the business, which we founded in 1998. And I think, you know, I suppose with, with Triple BE and the mandate by the government, it's always going to be difficult to really know what we would have done without, you know, um, with the scorecards changing every year. Uh, we've been level one for, for many years, but then it starts getting more aggressive and we have to make new strategies to keep on trading. So, and in the absence of that, you have to ask how much would we have transformed? But I'd like to believe we actually started becoming a diverse agency in 2005, 2006 already. We started bringing in people into, that's when Koli joined us in Kutala. And, and, and we had no force by the scorecard because our revenues was too low. So I'd like to think that somehow intuitively we know that our market or who our market is and who we speak to. And we understood that we have to have a more diverse agency in order to be more creative. Sure. I'd like to believe that, you know, yeah. what's transcribed since then. There's, there's various aspects we can discuss. I'm extremely passionate about the growth of people. I've been working with two township schools since 2007, 2006 to 2007, for 14 years of my life. Um, I do come from a very, very white Afrikaans, almost racist background. So I know my background into it, like I know it intimately, but I know where I want to be. And, and, and I'm, I'm very, very um, grateful to be part of this conversation. Great. Great, great. No, thank you. Thanks for the time. So uh, um, uh, as we discussed earlier on in the briefing is that I, I want to look at three aspects. So uh, because this transformation, this transformation um, and inclusivity discussion can last a whole day. But for this morning, we, we want to look at ownership, uh, leadership and talent in agencies. We want to look at uh, the role that clients can play or have played or are playing. So when we say clients, so it's the ones that we get briefs from our day-to-day -day relationships, but also the ones that onboard us, which is procurement and what role that they've got to play. I've got a, a, a couple of um, examples of, of how I experienced them when I ran my own um, agency back in the days, but also um, uh, being part of a bigger group. And then uh, we want to talk about the work because we're all passionate about the work, having two creative leaders here um, and the client as well, the work needs to uh, be discussed um, in the end, and then also take questions. So to the to the people watching, I'll take questions as we go along, uh, but also um, take a couple of questions at the end. 
So last month when we had a conversation with Andrea and Sean, I mentioned about being at dinner and um, Zamo illustrated it in a slide, but I spoke about if we had a dinner and there's a long dinner table and we had clients on the right and agencies on the left, when you look at telco, it's all transformed in terms of client facing, you've got black leaders there, uh, banking, black leaders, um, FMCG, you've got black leaders. And then when it comes to advertising, um, you're looking at um, it's, it's, it's male and pale. If not, it's, it's male, right? Um, and you've got a sprinkle of, or maybe one or two black females. And I think that dinner conversation would be very uncomfortable if we talked about diversity and, and inclusion. And, and I want to ask um, Veli, in your opinion, where have we come unstuck? It's 26 years later of when South Africa became uh, independent. And every research that shows, when you look at stock fails, when you look at shopper marketing, when you look at consumer marketing, when you look at anything that has to do with the consumer, we're talking to a black woman. And that's our consumer. That's the one that we're trying to service. But how is it that um, um, creative leadership, agency leadership at a group and even at an opco level is majority white um, male? Um, what do you think, where, where, where have we become unstuck? And, and how do we start um, um, moving forward? And, and I mean, we, we're not saying, and, and again, I liked earlier on, it's, it's not about exclusion because we want to include, but it's about having fair and equitable um, um, either leadership uh, opportunities or ownership, yeah? All right, no, no, th thank you for that, Bongani. Um, I think largely there's been a resistance uh, to transformation. Um, there's been a resistance to transformation for the very reason that we've been discussing, that, um, people don't see the value that it has to the work. Um, and most importantly, people haven't accepted uh, the point that it's not a mechanism to replace, but it's a mechanism to grow. So uh, the tension starts there, you know, um, and, and a lot of people have been kind of holding on with the view that they are going to be replaced, right? So that's where the tension starts. Um, and, the whys, I think, are very common. We, we know why, you know, we've seen people resist transformation. We've seen people try uh, circumvent and use the laws uh, uh, to benefit themselves. So the intention of why we need to transform, I think has been lost to an, a, a large majority of the people, you know, uh, and the people that have accepted it have either accepted it for or business reasons, but the true form and the true purity and intention of why we need to transform the industry uh, by, by, by uh, having uh, leadership that is in control and that can make the decisions and, and ownership and, and such. Um, and, but I think the biggest failure uh, has been the implementation and the monitoring of the laws. Um, we've got a MAC charter that is um, our guiding charter that um, has not uh, uh, materialized in its full force because the MAC charter council that is, is meant to police this charter has not been established. So people can get away with, you know, uh, setting up trust. They can get away with uh, basically beating the system to, to get the, uh, uh, the BE scorecard without someone checking, them, you know, checking the valid validity of, of those scorecards to, to check what is actually happening at an ownership level. So that is the, the biggest thing that we need to fix. And that's something that I've talked to the ACA about, it's something that I'm working uh, uh, with them towards that. If you don't have a body like the Mad Charter Council that polices and actually puts punitive measures to the people that intentionally defeat the, 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 the transformation agenda, then it's almost like having um, laws and a constitution without the police. You know, if there's no consequence for you, uh, if you are untransformed, 
um, then you don't have any reason to transform. So uh, also from the client side, uh, as much as clients are really pushing the transformation uh, agenda, but you find that um, there's no punitive, people need to understand that by not transforming, there's a consequence. Now, we need to actually up that. And I think uh, the appointment of the transformation uh, um, Mac Charter Council is pivotal to make sure that these laws are monitored, these BE scorecards and trusts are, are actually unveiled and monitored. Um, so, so, so I think that has been the biggest enemy is the understanding of the benefits of transformation. Um, it's clients, because at the end of the day, it's the clients that control the pace of uh, 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 the transformation agenda, because that's where the money comes from, right? Now, even when you look at the laws, uh, the reason why they progressively become uh, more stricter is because people look at the laws as a way to see how they can beat them to get this score without really transforming. And you find that each amendment is trying to fix and, 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 and um, uh, stop a loophole. So if people in, had the right intent in the first place, they wouldn't be looking at these laws as, 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 as an intent. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another thing uh, that, that I'll end. Um, the transformation laws themselves need to be looked at by the industry and the industry bodies, because I think when the transformation laws were developed in the 90s, they didn't even factor in entrepreneurship. Um, a, a company like Avatar, two black guys that uh, started it, was not even in the plans because it, it, it wasn't possible at that time. So the laws were designed to make black participants uh, 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 get equity in a white, untransformed advertising industry. Now, we've had 26 years of people that have worked in these agencies that can start uh, their own agencies, but the laws still incentivize deals for you to buy ownership in a white system, right? Now, even that needs to be re looked at, even from a client perspective saying that, what is the difference uh, and, and how can we start having more new entrants, black owned, female owned companies that we support uh, and we almost fast track that. Uh, uh, so you find that the laws have been kept up with the reality of the industry and, and as in any government law, that's, that's what happens. So we as an industry need to start saying, what are we doing for entrepreneurship? What are we do doing for new entrants? What are we doing for youth owned agencies so that we ourselves develop a plan that moves faster than the pace of the laws sure. that were intended for yeah. black people to get a piece of the industry rather than ownership and control of the full industry. So, so sure. that's where I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's gone and done. Yeah. So, so speaking about entrepreneurship, Pepe, I mean, um, you are an entrepreneur. You, uh, I mean, I read your story where you were part of a bigger group, a uh, global um, group. You bought, you bought yourselves out, um, but and, and then you've ended up um, uh, doing a transaction, which is I, I'd probably look at it as a hybrid, where you've got people that have been part of your business, but then you've also got investors that are external, right? Um, and 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 the reason why I wanted you on this panel is 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 to speak through your journey as an entrepreneur. Um, I remember um, I had a conversation with Kenzie to say, um, I've started a new uh, a business with, with partners. And at some point uh, it, will, it will get to where the question is asked about having females in, in, um, in, this, in this agency I've started. Um, and, and, and my heart skipped a beat when you think about the blood, sweat and tears of entrepreneurship, the bank refusing loans and, 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 and you actually, you probably, as when you're married, your business becomes your second wife, you know? And now you're told to give, not to give, to sell 51% of it. And you think about the journey. When, when did it hit you? What happened? Were you, did you lose a client? Uh, were you taking a walk and you decided that oh, this is the right thing to do as a South African? What happened? You're on yes. mute. No, 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 no. I'm going there. <laughs> I, I'm not playing according to rules. So, 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 uh, Billy said so much there. So, let me at the outset start, as I said in our little chat before, 
Hmm. Um, I think there's always, and, and, and I think it's going to be forever, there's always more to do. You know, the way I approach the product of our business, it's never good enough. It's never good enough. I always want to do better. I always want to do more. It's part of growth. I believe you're almost, you're never going to be where you have to be. So, so I just want to say that at the outset, as I go into the sort of answer, that, that I think we have a hell of a lot more to do. Um, but you asking where, where did the sort of aha moment happen? You know, very naturally, as I said, 2010, we, we just came out of bankruptcy. We, we couldn't afford to employ more senior people in our business beyond Gareth and myself. One of the first people we employed as a senior person was a guy by the name of Laurent Marty, who was, a, who was an ex-client. Who we felt, geez, imagine having that thinking in our stable and he wanted to get into advertising. And he turns out to be the best strategist I've ever worked with. Now, now at that stage, have I been more conscious and not saying you couldn't find an excellent strategist, but that's the one who crossed our path. And I would honestly say, due to his intellect that he brought into our business, it was a huge part of that what made us pitch winning. So we've created probably 200 jobs off the back of the right person. Now, during that journey, naturally what started to happen, I mean, at one stage, we have five different smaller companies within our group. Five of them, the MDs, are female, and three of them black female. And, and that was not done because there's a scorecard. Those were the natural people that grew in our organization and that displayed the leadership um, potential that moved up in the business. So, so, so I think there's various aspects we need to debate, you know, at this dinner conversation in the yeah. morning. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I need to understand, are we speaking about ownership? Because, yes. When you start a business from scratch in 1998, from nothing, and you start in the E-League of clients, and it takes you 11 years to get your first A-League client, 11 years. I mean, your number one, it's, it's not like it's, it's like your child. It is exactly that. It is as emotional a connection as to your own child. Your one, number one thing that you're doing as the founder and as an entrepreneur is keeping that child alive. It's like now in the corona, our only mandate to ourselves, we don't care about profit, is to keep our people in jobs and to keep our child alive. Yeah. So that's always been the highest on our consciousness, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, this is all about consciousness. I don't think people, I don't agree with Vili that people are just blocking transformation. They're, just, they're not conscious of how important it is because there's maybe some other things that's more critical for, for, for people in business. Mm. So... So, so I think on our journey, naturally, Colisa has been on the board for a decade. Um, he's been a shareholder for more than a decade. Kutala and Pumi is new, but Kutala was on the board two years ago, I think, already, or 18 months, two years before we started doing this current deal. Um, and then Pumi was already an MD of Ignite at that stage. Sure. So these were already executives in our business. So I think at the level of executives, that naturally happened in our business, not because we we're chasing a scorecard, because those were the best people in our business. Mm. The equity transformation was forced by, by the scorecard that's put the pressure on the big corporations that their suppliers must be 51% black owned. That's the truth. Yeah. I think in the absence of that, maybe in five or eight years' time, when I want to maybe move on, I think we would have offloaded equity to the exact same people as we did now. Sure. So maybe that was sped up and that was sped up. If I have to be absolutely honest, that was sped yep. up because of the pressure from, from our bigger clients. Yes. Um, and then the last thing I want to say on that, one of the biggest reasons we did what we did was because we paid fair value. You know, yeah. like when you start a business from scratch, and you, you build that equity and you don't take anything out of that business for 20 years, I think it would be wrong to, to, to want to transform that business without getting fair value. And we had sure. an external investor who saw the potential of the business to grow because we believe yeah. we are at the beginning of what we're going to do in this yes. industry. Um, and that's not arrogance. That's just because we have got a big vision for this business of ours. And we found an amazing investment partner with Sanatla who bought into the business 
And a last small little thing, which is quite ironic, we started working on transformation two and a half years ago, but the previous deal fell through because the guys wanted to use our own money to buy us. So there's also a lot of, there's a lot of maneuvering going out there to enrich a few people, yes. not right. And True. we saw through that, well, why not just actually fund our own people to own our business? And that's how yes. this deal came, came along. And okay. now, I mean, I, I'm really proud of it because I think it's a, it's mm -hmm. a win for everyone. Sure. It's going to be a long-term win for our shareholder, external mm -hmm. shareholder. It'll be a long-term yeah. win for all of us together in this business now. Yeah. So that's how, that's how we find ourselves where we are today. Yeah. Thanks, Pepe. So, uh, Kenzie, you represent an A-League client, I'm sure. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and what I find with A-League clients, the new term I'll be using now, is the pitch document comes in and you look at it and you're excited. I mean, I've run my own small shop. And as you get down, you start seeing things like they want this such a big team, have you won awards, have, and suddenly you, your, your big dreams of winning an A-League client are this big as a, as, a, as, a, as a small SMME turning over maybe 2 million rand to this because you, you haven't won awards, you haven't, you haven't met all these things. And ultimately, it sort of defaults to the bigger guys, you know? Um, and even when it's a big account, um, a humongous account, you sometimes people just freak out and get scared to say, how can I handle a net bank? How can I handle a, a telecom or a Vodacom? Because I don't have the resources. How, how, how have you played a part as a client yourself? Um, and, I, and, I, and I say yourself, it's you in your personal capacity, but also as the bank. Um, but also... In the back end, um, how have you capacitated? Because I remember, I always laugh, um, procurement, I think, appeared in 20, 2009, before we used to just send uh, CEs and POs would come. You know, Suddenly, now they go to procurement. So this guy's called procurement came in 2009, 2010. How have, how have they played a role in NetBank um, in terms of assisting this journey? Yeah, thanks, Bongani. So I think before I answer your question, I actually just want to reflect on both what Bailey and Pepe said. And I, I'm actually in between both of them. And let me tell you why. I think there's a role for both. I think that to Bailey's point, we absolutely have to have black agencies that were developed and you know, created by black people, um, like the avatars of the world, like the odd numbers of the world. I think that's very important. At the same time, it doesn't take away that because if we just ignored then, okay, cool. So that's all we're going to work with. There are great agencies like your Joe Publix who then in their own journey get to a point where they do realize that um, it's not just the level one, ownership is also important and do the type of deals that they did. So if you, and then maybe just going back to your question. So if I look at our roster of agencies, we actually have a combination of that. We've got a couple of fully black owned agencies like the odd number, um, our PR agency is Riverbed, which is owned by Mona Lisa, a black woman. At the same time, um, to Pepe's point, you know, when I met with them about two years ago, and I said to Joe Public, I think you guys are doing extremely well from a level one perspective. I'd love to see transformation from an ownership perspective. And that's important because, um, you know, it, it then means the industry does grow a lot quicker when you're having, you know, both those, those sort of conversations. So that's, yeah, I think like, that's something again, I'm, I'm in between both. I think you, you sure. need to do both of them. And then, so like I said, from a, a net bank perspective, we definitely brought on board both. We, the clients, our agencies who we don't feel like are transformed from an ownership perspective, because they are normally on level one anyway, we really try say, to have conversations. And we've got two other agencies that who are on our books right now that we're talking about ownership. Because like I said, I want to work with agencies whose ownership reflects the country that we live in and make money from right yeah then we've also got um so i've mentioned the odd number in riverbed but we also did something which you know is still work in progress i'm not sure how really it's going to play out we brought on board three fully black owned smaller agencies black powder stratnovate to get um jobs that would actually normally go to joe public but we bring fenced to say this is these are going to go to these agencies and hopefully grow over time so that when, I knew when, the, when they 
fill in the procurement thing. They've actually done work for a big client. They yes, yes. have maybe won awards for a big client. I mean, all of that. And so we kicked that off last year. Unfortunately, when COVID-19 hit, you can imagine our marketing budget was cut by 30%. Um, and we're really trying to figure out how do we ensure that they get the billings that are required um, to be able to be a sustainable, long-term and successful agency. Um, and then, I mean, if, if you talk about the leadership piece and all of that, it, for me, it, it's so important that, you know, the people that you're working with, that you're on the table and doing negotiations with, that they, again, reflect South Africa. So if you look at my marketing execs at NetBank, the head of marketing at CIB is a black guy, Deboko Mutsipe. The head of marketing at RBB is a black woman, Mbimba. The head of group marketing is a black woman, Tabuseng Matsecha. The head of marketing for NAR, which is an APEC Africa region, is a black guy, Maseida. The head of marketing for the wealth cluster is a black woman, Nancy. So even that makes me extremely proud because for me, it, and, and the, the comment that when you get there, you get there on your own, I think it's just completely unnecessary. Yes. You bring others with you and you are best placed to do that because you understand the journey that you yourself have gone through. Yeah. And then maybe this is the last point to reflect on the procurement conversation in terms of the role that they play. It's so amazing because for me, our procurement team believes in our transformation journey in marketing the way we do. And, yeah. you know, this is something I've been saying, I've said twice in other sort of webinars around procurement actually needs to deliver on the vision that I want for marketing. Yeah. Um, and that's not just a pricing vision, right? That is working with the best, working with agencies who are transformed. And that's the journey that procurement has been with us on. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I don't know in other businesses, but I know at NetBank, definitely, like my procurement yeah. team is a part of that journey. Yeah. Thanks, Kenzie. So I, I just wanted to, to, to note, um, when we speak about diversity and inclusion, I know the issue of Black women comes up. And earlier on, I'd said, I don't think Pepe Veli and myself are qualified to be part of that conversation. And I'm hoping that uh, maybe next month we can have somebody else taking my spot and leading that conversation. But I think a black woman in this industry and women in general, uh, a conversation needs to happen and it needs to happen by then, right? So we're not excluding it uh, for today. But um, Pepe, I, I wanted to discuss around um, uh, LGBTQ community. Have we, as an industry, accepted them um, rather than stereotyping them to being the creatives, right? Um, but more around being inclusive and, and, and welcoming them and accepting them as an industry. And Bailey, I would also want you to comment on that, but I'll start with Pepe then, and then come to you. This this is becoming a joke. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I'm way behind. I used to be quite a blusher. Um, <laughs> my mother still blushes at 76, but I'm beyond blushing. I'm just like, listen, I'm just a tool. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just here in the hands of the industry. I'm sure. sorry, man. And hopefully that's the last time I keep on doing that. Um, I'm kind of get caught into the conversation. We, we, we actually used... Um, a person from the community, a gay or a transgender um, individual in a net bank commercial, interestingly. Um, I, I find it an interesting question. I find the question almost as, um, how can I put it? It's not provocative, but, but I, I kind of, you know, this is a very on the fringe industry. This is a very progressive industry. This, this is not like, a, and I don't want to insult engineers, but it's not like, because they're also in banks. But this is not the engineering industry. This is a very artistic industry. And if you go back in the art forms, this is the most inclusive of industries, which is why I'm waiting for that gap where I want to actually interrogate where we really are at. I would say, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Um, so, so we even on our platform at, at, with, with another one of our Joe Public, it's a conversation a transgender lady and and the other day on one of our platforms so so i don't think we make a thing about it we, we're inclusive as a business i'll speak not just for our own business there's a lot more work to be done um i, I want to chat a little bit just now when i have a moment on what is the number that we are targeting because so so on your question yeah, I think we are inclusive as industry by nature that we are an creative industry. 
and creative beings by nature are the more sort of liberals of traditionally. So, so it doesn't make logical sense to me that, that we think we are this, we're blocking anything in this industry. That's not, not in my experience. On the bodies that I've sat on for the last 15 years, oh. I don't see that. In, in the top 15 or top 12 agencies in the industry that probably controls 80% of the spend, mm. I don't see that, what I'm hearing in the conversation. The, 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 the thing that I found maybe as a, as a pointer that was interesting in our debate at a board level, because obviously there's a bigger challenge on the creative side than the rest of the business. I'll have to put that on the table and there's various reasons for that. But we started debating, so what does transformation look like? Because Kenzie just said it, um, you know, we want to reflect, we want to, we want to reflect our population. We really have to start looking at that number um, because it is, it's 80%. 10% Indian and colored and 10% white, roughly. And there's 3 million, I think 3 million people over the age of 65 and 17 million youth. So there's 40 million employable people. But we know factually that 80% of that population is almost unemployable through, through a, a really horrendous educational system. And I know this for a fact because I work in it. Now, when you start doing those numbers, the realistic objective in the short term is 65%. It's not 80% because you would not be able to achieve that. And, and I'd love to start, I think at some stage in this, not in today, someone needs to go and do their homework on the real numbers and look at that. Because then what we did internally, we could say we are chasing 65% now in terms of not, not at a, a equity level, at a staff level. We are chasing to get to 65, we're at about 56%. So, of course, that tells me we've got more to do because what you measure improves. And I find when you, when you deal with real numbers, when I measure the work, I know five years ago, 77% of our television work was wallpaper. And I know now it's less than 20% because every year I measure it. Now, when we measure our transformation to Veli's point of actually acting upon it and not just talking and making sort of loose statements and saying this is like how I feel factually, so factually, we are chasing 65% because we believe we can deliver on that with all the challenges we've experienced over the years. Mike, Mike Cawley's creative department is only 46% transformed. That's a huge issue for us, but we've experienced huge churn because black creatives are also highly sought after and often poached. And when I try to bring a senior black creative into our team, they wanted 50% more than Colisa. So, so there's also a huge price tag. So, I mean, but, but, but in general, I've gone on to a completely different sort of subject. But, but to your first point, I think we are an inclusive industry in my experience, yeah. in my circle that I deal with. Um, and, I, and I believe the people that I deal with on my bodies that I represent, the top 10, 12 agencies, I've seen for the last at least, and maybe that's also too late, 25 years later, but for at least the last five years, I've seen real strides made yeah. in agency driving transformation. Bongani, mm -hmm. can I come in? Sorry, Veli, before um, you answer Bongani's question, I have to say, Pepe and Veli, just as a marketeer looking into the, I think you guys are not as transformed, by the way. So I do think it, it, it I don't know, is it a, a marketing problem in terms of how you are talking about the, the things that you're doing as an industry? Because I don't want to lie, as as client looking into the industry, I can hand on heart say, I feel like clients, we are transformed. And Mzamo Masito put up a very powerful slide last week at the Nipeng IMC conference um, of the heads of advertising agencies and the heads of marketing from a you know, brand's perspective. And the marketing slide was incredibly transformed. Still, you know, some areas where there's you know, no trouble, but I mean, overall. So it will be interesting to understand the numbers and the real stats, but you definitely have a messaging story if you are transformed, because me looking into the industry, I feel like there's, there, there's a lot to be done. Sure, agreed. Uh, Ellie? I think I think we are past that debate uh, and uh, being in the industry for so long and running um, an agency of my nature, the debate whether we are transformed or we are not transformed is, is pretty obvious. We are not transformed when we are not transforming at the pace that is needed to 
to have clients like Kenzie look into the industry and say uh, we are transformed. There's been efforts, I think, uh, uh, as we've talked about. But, you know, COVID taught me a lot of things about the desire and intent. Now, what we need to ask, and I mean, I've been an entrepreneur since I was a teenager. I, I fully understand the pressures and what is needed uh, uh, to, to run a business. Now, and I also understand the list of priorities. Now, if you had to ask an average untransformed agency, where does transformation play in the list of priorities? It would be very, very low, right? And that's why we as an industry need to have a plan for the people that do not want to transform and do not have transformation as a priority because it is important for the progression of the industry. Now, that's why I'm saying that the consequences and, and, and I love Kenzie's um, uh, um, um, uh, input earlier about the active steps that they have done as clients to make sure that they have a transformed uh, a panel. I, I love what I was, I was speaking to, to CISA, the CEO of uh, uh, SA Tourism, where their procurement ring-fenced 30% of their business uh, for Black-founded and Black-owned agencies. Now, that is intentional, right? And now, for the people that do not want to transform or are resistant to transform, now there's an immediate business consequence because um, I think to believe that people will just transform for their own good or because they see what it will do to society is ambitious for some. Now, um, uh, uh, there needs to be a business uh, consequence to that. And that's how you start you start moving the needle of, 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 of transformation. Um, because without that, we, 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 no one, no one will, 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 will transform. So, so it's, it's, it's up to client and I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, Kenzie and NetBank are, are, are doing that because there are a lot of agencies that are engaged with that cannot get access to market. A lot of black owned agencies that cannot get access to market and clients are now starting to be deliberate in giving and ring fencing. So how many clients are ring fencing uh, spend for black owned agencies? If you look across the board, not many, right? Um, and and that, becomes, that becomes a concern. So, so, so we, start, we start by making sure that there's a structure. Now I sit as, um, uh, a, a transformation uh, head uh, for the IAB, right? And what we are embarking on is an academic study of the numbers, because I think um, a lot of people use that confusion uh, and, and the answer at the end is, oh, but we don't know, you know? So for me, what I've said to the IAB uh, board and uh, the IAB Transformation Council is that let's partner up with an academic institution that will investigate these things. And I think um, the slide we, we saw in Mzamo's uh, presentation uh, uh, at the conference is clear. You, you could see it. Uh, uh, white agency leaders and black agency leaders, I think it was at 71% uh, uh, white agency leaders uh, and uh, um, uh, black um, agency leaders uh, with the remainder. Even more disturbing, the black females were even at a lower percentage. So the debate whether we are transformed or we are not transformed, it's, 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 it's clear. I mean, those, we see it. If you look at the top 10 agencies uh, and you see, you, you really start digging deep uh, and, and you look at that slide of, 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 the, of the ownership, you look at the slide of the control uh, and, and, and break black creatively. So I think we passed the conversation whether we transformed or we not transformed. I think for the few that have transformed, we need to continue rewarding them. Um, the people that are the forerunners like Joe Public that have done a very good uh, move 
to transform, those people should be rewarded because they're not part of the problem. But sure. we cannot ignore that a large part of this industry is flying below the radar, is untransformed, is getting away with uh, uh, finding loopholes in, in the BE legislation to achieve uh, a BE scoring. So we need to focus on them. I think um, your Joe Publix uh, your, uh, 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 are, are part of the solution and they become the template. I think the first thing that I said uh, when I, when I uh, um, uh, heard about and read about the, the Joe Public deal was that now this is a template for others because there are people that are just sitting, sitting there quietly, um, uh, not having the intention to transform. Now, COVID showed that if you've got the intention and the pressure to change things, you will over a weekend. We went in. The business was done a different way. COVID hit, it put enough pressure on people to do business differently. Now, if transformation was a high priority in people's lives that run these agencies, we are all business owners. We all have other priorities, but in our list of priorities, if transformation is, is way high up, we will achieve it. But if we say, okay, we need to do this first before for transformation is not a priority. It will not. It will not be achieved. Now, um, on, 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 on the question you asked, I think it's very important to use um, the Matt Charter preamble, which, 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 which I guess I can share after this. It, it, it's a long preamble, and what I've said is um, uh, we, we've spoken to the ACA, and we said let's use that preamble as a rule. Right, so that it can start guiding the way and become the plan that is beyond even the Mac Charter and the legislation, so that we know that what we are doing, the efforts of what we're doing, is to have an inclusive uh, uh, agency that reflects uh, a society. Now, it's easy to do, it's easy to do because we have to just look at the ex codes. We have to look at the mancos. We have to look at the at the leads and the leadership and the management of these agencies to uh, to see. It's very easy to walk into an agency and see whether it, it reflects uh, uh, the demographics of, of of the country just by just just by looking at who's got the power, who's making the decisions, and uh, what does the expo uh, look like um, before you even get to, to to other things. So so that is my opinion around that. But we do need. A roadmap, and it's something that I'm aggressively lobbying. Not only the ACA, but other industry bodies. I sit as uh, um, a director on um, the DMA. Um, I sit as transformation head for IAB. Um, I'm also in the Red and Yellow because there's also uh, I, I was chairman of the Red and Yellow um, uh, advisory board because there's also an education there to say, are we getting enough people into the industry, and and, and how are we nurturing that side. So. It, it, it's really it's really about intention and it's really about highlighting and having consequences for the people that have made a point to use be a legislation and mm -hmm. and, and, and circumvent the intention of the legislation um, yeah yeah I have a question actually for the three of you and it goes yes. back to the Mac charter and consequences. So if you, in banking, we've got the FSTC charter, and in banking, in order for us to operate, we, we get a legal license to operate, which we have to fulfill a number of things that the Reserve Bank wants us to fulfill. And then we also have a social license to operate, which is not really a legal document, but it's how we feel we want to show up. When we go and bid, for example, for Ekuruleni's um, transactional banking, Ekuruleni, looks at transformation, our BE scorecard and layers, and our scorecard has got ESD, financial inclusion, ownership, management, like all of those good things. And if we don't do well on that, we don't get business. Now, if I think of the MAC Charter, and I'm going to show my ignorance here, and this is, I think, where some of the problem lies. I don't even know what the MAC Charter looks like. I don't know if when the advertising industry created this MAC Charter, maybe I wasn't senior enough, I don't know if they came to marketeers to say, you know, are you signed on to this? Is this something that you will drive with us? Because when, I talk, when you talk about consequence management, 
the most basic consequence that will help you transform is when your business is at risk. Your business comes from marketeers, from clients. I don't know how engaged, I'm not engaged with them at all. I don't even know what it looks like. I remember a conversation when it was being developed and, you know, agencies were worried and all of that. But to be honest, it's, it's not, I just don't feel like it's something that we really engage with. And I, I'd be interested from the three of you guys in advertising, when you think of consequences, like what are you talking about? I'm assuming it's business, but then how does like marketing is not involved in this black chat? We don't know. I mean, at least me. And maybe I'm showing my ignorance. So, 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 um, so I'm very, uh, uh, Veli, can I respond? Okay. Uh, maybe let me also respond to a question. <laughs> I've been asking the question. So I, I, I think for me, what what I found, what I find interesting is that in advertising, money makes the world go round. Period. Right. So when you look globally uh, after Black Lives Matter, um, there were there was a letter sent by black um, creatives and agency leaders to the global holding companies. Suddenly, the global holding companies were exposed around race. But these same global companies have been holding agencies locally, getting revenues and revenues being exported. And it was never an issue. But because where they now operate from, which is New York and London, the issue has been highlighted. Suddenly, transformation is very important to them, right? So to answer your question, the punitive uh, consequence needs to always be revenue. You know, um, there's, there's no other way um, because we don't have license to operate like banking or telcos, whereby if you're going to pitch for government work, they're going to like look at all those things. And, and, I, and I also think as much as legislation is there, it's also the conscious of clients knowing that you are giving 300 million rand production plus fees to an agency and you very well know that they're not transformed. I've been in meetings where you've got a junior AD reading a Zulu script or, there's, or an English radio script and there's a Zulu word to a black client that you can't pronounce it. And the black client gets pissed off sorry to use the language, but nothing gets done. And that agency will send that AD again to that same black senior client and the senior client gets upset, but nothing gets done, right? And, 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 and it goes on and on. And I think there's also um, a moral side where senior black clients who are transformed like, you, like yourselves and, and many others to, to call it to say, no, you can't say you're transformed, but your whole agency facing team is white. As much as your BE and ownership, so even like Pepe's business, it would be wrong of him to have um, Koli and everybody on his board and they and 60% black owned, but the team that are facing NetBank on a day to day are a whole white team and the creative team is all white, then it goes against what we're trying to do. And um, that's, that's for me. 100%. I agree with you. I do agree with you and, and, and 100%. I think, I must say, I do think we need to start looking also at the numbers because I, I was, I mean, I saw Mzamo's slide and I was like 69 agencies. I'm not even aware of 15 of their names. You know, like, like, like you might show 69 agencies, but, but who actually controls this pie? And, the, and I know, Kenzie, um, I think, the point you're making, looking from the outside in, because I know inside our own business, we're not as transformed as we should be. As I said, we're sitting at below 60% in terms of just our staff complement. And we do have a real challenge in creative where we're sitting below 50% transformation and we're working on that. So we've got a mandate to ourselves. And thanks, Billy, we are leading the pack now. But I still feel, I feel like I have to mention because I don't know, Billy, maybe you should join the creative circle of South Africa whose purpose is transformation as a creative body. And then maybe have your voice be heard there as well. And maybe see what people are doing in the industry and also the ACA. Because if I do look at the numbers of the top 10 agencies of this country, now the MAC Charter, Kenzie, was a proactive move by the industry more than a decade ago that put on the table that we will implement 45% ownership transformation by 2018. Now, of the top 11 agencies in this country, who I'm thumb sucking, it controls about 75 to 85% of total spend. Of that 
portion, seven out of, or eight out of those 11 are 51% transformed. 51% ownership transformation. And uh, what we also forget is that we allowed in the past 20 years, New York to come in and gobble up all the big agencies. So at that stage, when we should have taken the gap and actually buy those agencies and keep them local, we allowed the internationals to buy them. So I don't know how easy it is to transform equity when you already sold your business to New York. But even with that, with, with, that, with that challenge, eight out of the 11 agencies in the top 11 are 51% owned and us being 63. So, so, so all I'm saying is there's work to be done, but I, don't, I must just caution that this narrative of nothing's done is not true from where I'm sitting. And maybe we should look at those boards because I've got the numbers on the boards as well. And I've got, it's not as if like nothing's happening and this is like a little white boys club which is being said in the, in, the, in, the, in the public space. It's not what I'm experiencing and what I'm seeing with the industry that I'm dealing with. Um, so there's a slightly two different views, but I do hear, Kenzie, that there's work to be done. Um, and, and I can tell you now, when I look at the young students coming in and I go to the Luris and I look at all those students, it's concerning that two out of 20 students are black, for me. So, and there's all those issues. So we had to start working with Muzi, um, I work directly with our schools. Tolly's building a pipeline through the One Show Boot Club Boot Camp into our agency. So we're starting to try and find talent from new places. But I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses. There's work to be done. But it's not like there's no work being done. And, 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 and the, the conversation is slightly positioned in the social space as if 20, 25 years later we've done nothing. Because the facts are not showing that when you look at the actual facts. If you look at equity staff in those agencies, the top 10, the majority of them are 65% black staff. So, so that's why I'm interested. What is that number that we must actually get to? Um, and, and I think getting to that number is quite a challenge on, on the agency side for various reasons. So, yeah. so sorry, Veli, I would have loved to give you an opportunity. Our, our dinner morning conversation has... Uh, unfortunately come to an end. Um, I, as I said, I think we would, we would probably be here until tomorrow morning because there's, you start getting into youth, you start getting into education and all this. But I think just uh, as, 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 as industry leaders and Kenzie, thanks for being on the call. I think in closing, it's really important. I, I always, I've got three boys and it, 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 it will hurt me if my son is going to go through the same battles that I'm going through. Because it means that the four of us have, would not have contributed in any way um, to this thing. But also I would hate it for Pepe's son to be packing for Australia because he feels totally excluded from being part of the South Africa that we're trying to build. So guys, thanks a lot for being part of the core. I will probably engage again in another conversation, but yeah. Um, uh, it's like a minute to 11 and uh, we need to get to probably our next uh, telcos. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> cheers, 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 cheers. Cool.